The rice will be in continuation when the debate resumes. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I take before the information of the Senate a revised ministry list. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Um, I thank the Senate. Uh, I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated representing arrangements for the infrastructure, transport and regional development portfolio to Senator Canavan. Uh, Mr. President, I also seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Cash will be absent from question time all week due to personal reasons. Uh, in Senator Cash's absence, Senator Canavan will represent the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Uh, Senator Colbeck will represent the Minister for Health. Senator Reynolds will represent the Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Last week, in an interview with uh, 3AW's Neil Mitchell, the minister described the age pension as, and I quote, generous. What? Yeah, that's what she described it as. Can the minister explain why pensioners doing it tough should accept her view that the payment is generous? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Okay, um, I thank you very much, and I thank the senator for his question. I also thank the senator for the opportunity to, to clarify. Uh, this particular statement. I understand that many older Australians, uh, particularly our age pensioners, are impacted significantly on cost of living pressures. But uh, I would like to say that the, the comments that were um, reported in the paper last week, I certainly did not intend to, to say or to infer that older Australians who rely on the age pension are doing it easy. And I am concerned that of any offence that may have been taken or caused to our older Australians. As I said, I know older Australians are doing it tough, and that's why one of the first things I did on becoming the Minister for Families and Social Services was to seek advice from my department in relation to deeming rates, which was the subject of the interview to which Senator Farrell is referring. In doing this, we managed uh, to provide um, assistance to uh, nearly a million older Australians and other recipients of allowances by reducing the deeming rates from the lower threshold by 75 basis points or 0.75 per cent and for the upper deeming rate by 25 basis points or uh, 0.25 per cent. This way we actually will see older Australians, about 360,000 older Australians, will actually end up in their weekly or their fortnightly payments with more money in their pocket. Um, so the other thing too, the track record of this government since it came uh, into this uh, into government is a very strong track record of supporting older Australians. Uh, we have increased the uh, the pension for singles by $117.80 a fortnight and $177.40 per fortnight for couples. You can be assured that this government will make a priority of looking after our older Australians. Yeah. Senator Farrell, supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the Treasurer refused to endorse Senator Rustin's description of pen the pension as generous. Instead, he said, uh, and I quote, I understand pensioners have challenging times. A number of pensioners do it really, really tough. Has the Treasurer or any other member of the gov government raised concerns with the minister about her comments? Senator Rustin. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Farrell for his follow-up question. Um, I agree entirely with the comments that the Treasurer made in relation to elder Australians, particularly our age pensioners, doing it, uh, doing it tough at the moment. Cost of living pressures, financial pressures on older Australians, uh, particularly those on pensioners. Um, you know, oh, order, Senator Farrell, on a point of order. Yes, my question wasn't whether the minister agreed with the Treasurer. My question was, has the minister has the treasurer spoken to her about her comments. Um, Senator Farrell, the minister has been speaking for 15 seconds. Um, I might also uh, say that the minister can be directly relevant to a question by directly, uh, directly addressing part of the question, as she's doing in this case. Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. Um, and in relation to older Australians um, and particularly aged pensioners, um, I will reiterate again and again and again that I understand that older Australians are doing it tough. Um, age pensioners are doing it tough. 
But Australia has a very comprehensive social welfare system, of which one part of that is the age pension. And the sustainability of our, of our social security system is absolutely essential. But I do not move away from order. the comments. Senator Farrell, on a point of order. Look, you were very generous uh, to uh, the minister, but my question was a simple one. Has the Treasurer or any other member of the government spoken to the Minister about uh, her comments? You have restated part of the question, Senator Farrell, and I reiterate that a Minister can be directly relevant to a question by being directly relevant to part of it. Um, I believe the Minister is being directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Mr President. Um, I will say it again. I accept the fact that older Australians, particularly aged pensioners, um, are doing it tough. And the Morrison government has quite clearly made it a priority to look after older Australians. Order. And our track Senator record Rustin, stands time has for itself. expired. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. In response to the uh, minister's offensive uh, claim, the National Seniors Australia chief advocate, uh, that very fine man, Mr. Ian Henschke from South Australia, said that, and I quote: "Look, I realise the minister is very new." But maybe she should go and read a report that was done by per capita group that one in four pensioners are living in poverty. Has the minister now read the report by the per capita group, and does the minister still consider the pension to be Order. generous? Senator Farrell. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you. Thank you, Senator Farrell, for his follow-up question. Um, the track record of the Morrison government when it comes to prioritising older Australians is one of which we can be proud. Notwithstanding the fact that many older Australians are doing it tough with cost of living pressures, I think that the track record of the Morrison government in ensuring that we um, twice yearly um, not just increase um, pensions by CPI but take into account a suite of other impacts that impact on, on, our, old, uh, on our older Australians and our pensioners, the fact that we have uh, you know, in, introduced $365 million <coughs> over order. two years for Senator the Senator Rustin. Senator Wong, on a point of order. The question didn't go to a history of the social security system. The question, <laughs> the question went to whether or not the minister still considers the pension to be generous. Um, Senator Wong, I think given the quote read out by Senator Farrell, the material I'm listening very carefully to from Senator Rustin, I believe, is directly relevant to the quote. You've restated the question. Um, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question as long as they are directly relevant. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Um, now, I'm not sure whether Senator Wong actually heard the answer to the first question that was asked by Senator Farrell. Um, I said at, the, in the, at the, uh, the response to the first question from Senator Farrell um, that I certainly did not intend to infer that older Australians were doing it easy. And I am concerned about any offence that may have occurred or been taken by older Australians over comments that were made. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Minister Cormann. Can the minister update the Senate on how many people have already lodged their tax returns and received their income tax cuts? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson uh, for that question. And, uh, Mr President, I'm pleased uh, to advise the Senate that hard-working Australians are embracing uh, our lower income taxes agenda with gusto. Uh, they are embracing, of course, the opportunity that it brings in terms of strengthening the economy moving forward, uh, creating more jobs. And indeed, I can, I can advise the Senate that the number of tax returns already submitted to the Australian uh, Taxation Office is uh, exceeding uh, that which had been, those which had been submitted in previous years very, very strongly indeed. As of this morning, as of this morning uh, the Tax Office has received over 2.9 million lodgements. Uh, which is a 19 per cent increase, or more than 460,000 more lodgements than this time last year, and already more than 1.3 million individual taxpayers have received their income tax refunds, uh, with the ITO having processed over 1.3 million individual 2019 income tax refunds, with a total value of $3.1 billion. But this equates to an average uh, tax refund amount of $2,381, and as uh, Senator Payne uh, quite rightly says, that is real money. That is real money into workers' pockets. It is real money into the economy. It is real money that will stimulate the economy and help create more jobs into the future. And of course, um, as on behalf of 
uh, millions of Australians that stand to benefit from our lower income taxes agenda. We again thank the Senate uh, for having uh, strongly, strongly in the end, uh, endorsed uh, our plan for lower taxes and a stronger economy and more jobs, even though it took some perhaps a bit, a bit longer uh, than others. Uh, in addition, uh, the ITO has received over 1.3 million calls, which is over 500,000 more than this time last year. Uh, so the response by hard-working Australians uh, once again uh, demonstrates why it was so important that the government worked so hard with the Senate and others uh, to get Senator our tax Coleman. cut package through the Parliament. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. What is the impact of so many Australians claiming their tax cuts early? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, what it does is it uh, ensures that hardworking Australians get to keep more of their own money, uh, and that is, of course, uh, that was, of course, our promise uh, leading into the election. I mean, this was the government delivering on one of the core promises that we took to the last election, and that is to ensure that hardworking Australians would get to keep more of their own money. As I say. Uh, our income tax cuts legislation uh, delivers more money into workers' pockets. It means more money into the economy. It means that hard-working Australians, families around Australia, get to spend more of their own money on their priorities, which of course will help uh, to uh, strengthen the economy uh, into the future. It will help create more jobs. It will help ensure that families around Australia have a better opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and, and again, <laughs> and again, I mean, I. We will continue to explore opportunities for lower taxes, but we of, course know, we of course know that the Labor Party will continue to stand for higher taxes, which would lead to weaker growth and a weaker economy. Order. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, I hope the answer to this question is no, but are there any risks to the personal income tax cuts that the government has legislated? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, sadly, sadly, I will have to disappoint Senator, uh, Senator Patterson. Order. Uh, the, we, will have to be, we will have to be ever vigilant. We will have to be ever vigilant. There are risks, and the name of the risk is Labor. The name of the risk is Labor. While it was very difficult to ascertain what precisely their position on income taxes was, in the end, we know one thing. We know one thing. When it's all said and done, Labor stands for higher taxes. And higher taxes would mean a lower growth, a weaker economy, a weaker country, and fewer jobs. Where, of course, the Australian people can rest assured that as long as we are the government of Australia, we will stand for lower taxes, stronger growth, more jobs, better opportunity for Australians to get ahead. Uh, and, and, and of course, that is, that is the agenda that we took to the last election that was overwhelmingly endorsed by the Australian people. And that is the agenda we will continue to prosecute over the next three years, all the way to the next election. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Home Affairs Minister, Senator Reynolds. The Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, the Right Honourable James Marape, said today that he would like to see, and I quote, the full closure of the entire asylum processes. Prime Minister Marape has previously stated that he wanted it to happen, and I quote, as soon as possible. Can the minister detail what process the government will put in place to expedite a durable solution for refugees and asylum seekers on Manus Island? The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. I thank uh, Senator Keneally for that question. And I uh, just note to I thank her for the, my first question as the Minister for Defence in this capacity. And I would also acknowledge that there is no greater responsibility for any minister than this portfolio and the safety and security of our nation. And I look forward to working with all in this chamber and the other on all of these issues. Uh, in relation to the question on the meeting with the Papua New Guinea Prime Minister and also the ministers, I can confirm that we had a very productive uh, meeting this morning uh, with, the minister, uh, with the Prime Minister and his ministers. Uh, we had a very productive discussion uh, with them. Uh, the Governor of Manus was uh, in attendance. And again, we had a discussion about the future of Manus and about the base and also the facility. We agreed that we would continue to work together to further develop uh, the facilities there with a view to uh, new employment opportunities for those on Manus Island and for others. So it was a very productive discussion and uh, we discussed all aspects of the facilities there and how we move forward together in relation to those facilities. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The Minister for Home Affairs recently said that he wants the number of people, and I quote, down to zero. 
And today it has been reported that taxpayers could fund resettlement packages to encourage refugees to live in Papua New Guinea. Can the minister advise how these resettlement packages will work and when will the government have the number of people on Manus down to zero? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again for that question. Uh, that issue was discussed in further detail uh, with, with the ministers, but it, further detail of that I'll have to take on notice because those discussions are still ongoing. Senator Keneally, thank final you. supplementary question. Given the government's failure to find a durable solution over the past six years, and people are now being held indefinitely in Manus on, in detention, what backup plan is in place if the Papua New Guinea government withdraws its support for the Manus Regional Processing Centre? Order, order. I need to be able to hear the question. Order. Senator Keneally, for that order. question. Senator Reynolds. But I would uh, highlight the first issue is that nobody is in detention on Manus Island. And I would highlight again who it was. It wasn't those on this side uh, who put people into detention. That was solely those on the other side your problem. We have spent the last six years working cooperatively with the Papua New Guinean government, and again I extend our thanks for the way in which they have engaged on this issue. But there is nobody in detention on Manus order. Island. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. The minister points out that it, people have been there for six years. On if she doesn't want to characterise them in detention, order, she Senator can Keneally. at least tell us Senator when Keneally, they are going Senator Keneally, please to resume your seat. Uh, Senator Keneally, that is a debating point. That is not a point of order on, on the relevance of the answer. Senator Reynolds. Uh, again, there is nobody on detention there, and there is only the reason anybody was on that island uh, is your responsibility. Australia takes its international obligations seriously, and we provide protection to refugees consistent with those obligations that are set out in statutory refugee order. frameworks. Senator Reynolds, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. There are only 15 seconds left, and the minister has not gone close to answering the question: What backup plan is in place if the Papua New Guinea government withdraws its support Senator, for the RPC in Manus? Senator Keneally, you've restated part of the question. The minister is being directly relevant to other parts of the question you asked. I cannot instruct the minister how to ask a question. The minister is being directly relevant to part of the question asked, Senator Reynolds. You, you might not like my answer because you're the one who's responsible for, for the mess that we are cleaning up. However, yeah, Australia, yeah. along with the United States of America and Canada, collectively offer a majority of global resettlement Order. places every year. Yeah. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Order. Mr. President. My question Order on my is left. also Senator to the Fawcett Minister the for Defence. Can the minister update the Senate on how Australia's military contribution to the Middle East is supporting efforts to increase security and stability in the region? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett for this question, and I also thank him for his service, both in uniform and now in, in this place in the committee work that he does. First of all, I've got to say that Australians should be all Australians should be extremely proud of the contribution that our men and women in the ADF. Uh, making to the security and the stability of the Middle East. Today, over a thousand ADF members are deployed across the Middle East, and our people are contributing to international coalition efforts to co combat Daesh and other terrorist groups, building the capacity of security forces in Afghanistan and also in Iraq, and supporting maritime security and peace operations. Can I say that the professionalism of our defence personnel and the high standards by which they all conduct themselves was impressed upon me repeatedly by the officials in Afghanistan, Iraq and also the UAE. And I saw firsthand the results of the efforts of our ADF men and women. And can I just say their contributions are utterly magnificent and everybody here in this place and in the nation should be extremely proud of their contributions. Now, when I spoke to our men and women, two things struck me. The first one is how incredibly proud they are of each other. When I asked what was the one thing that they would take away from their experiences, it was all about the men and women that they work with, and also how much they've learnt by working alongside their colleagues in Afghanistan, Iraq and also UAE. But the second thing they said is that by deploying uh, into the Middle East, it also provided them with a greater degree of appreciation for what it means to be Australian and how lucky we all are that we were born here in Australia. In Afghanistan, the ADF continues to support the Afghan government's efforts to provide stability for its people. Uh, 
And for example, over 8 million Afghan children are currently enrolled in schools in Afghanistan. 40 per cent today who are girls. We should all be very Order, proud Senator of that Reynolds, contribution. Time for the answers expired. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how Australia is supporting efforts to counter Islamic State and other terrorist groups in both Iraq and Syria? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Since 2014, Australia has been a leading contributor to the United States-led global co coalition to combat Daesh in both Iraq and Syria. The territorial defeat of Daesh in March this year was a significant achievement, freeing millions of people from a barbaric uh, regime and also oppressive control. However, despite its territorial defeat, unfortunately Daesh and other terror groups remain a potent threat in the Middle East and also increasingly in our own region. The Morrison government is committed to continuing efforts to prevent any attempt by Daesh and groups like it from harming Australians or our interests overseas. As such, the coalition government recently extended the deployment of a Royal Australian Air Force KC-30A air-to-air refuelling aircraft and we will soon redeploy a uh, wedge-tail aircraft to contribute to the ongoing fight against Daesh in the region. Thank you. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate also how Australia is supporting efforts to increase maritime security, stability and prosperity in the Middle East? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Operation Manitou is Australia's contribution to the combined maritime forces. This is a US-led 33 nations partnership focused on countering terrorism, preventing piracy, encouraging regional cooperation and also to promote a safe marine environment. Since 2014, Royal Australian Navy vessels, including the recently returned HMAS Ballarat, uh, which returned home after a nine-month deployment to the region, have seized nearly 10 tonnes of heroin, 58 tonnes of hashish, equating to an estimated street value of over $6 billion Australian. Our ships have also interdicted vessels carrying illicit weapons and ammunition destined for battlefields in such places as Yemen and also Syria. The HMAS Ballarat, during a nine-month deployment alone, sees nearly 20 tonnes of illicit drugs, nearly half a million rounds of small arms ammunition and several hundred bags of chemical fertiliser, likely destined for use in the manufacture Order. of improvised Senator explosives. Reynolds, time's and I thank them for the Senator Di Natale. Uh, my question is for the Leader of the Government uh, representing the Prime Minister. Uh, on Thursday last week, the Bureau of Meteorology said that the drought that the Murray-Darling Basin was experiencing was, I quote, the most severe in 120 years of records. Minister, do you and the government accept the advice of the Bureau and other scientific bodies that climate change is a significant contributor to current and future droughts? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. The Australian government is committed to effective action on climate change. That's why uh, we have taken measures uh, which uh, have ensured uh, that we will meet and exceed our emissions reduction target for 2020 agreed to in Kyoto, uh, and we have a plan to ensure we meet our 2030 emissions reduction target uh, agreed to in Paris. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, given that you've accepted that uh, climate change is a major contributor to climate change, and given that the single biggest cause of climate change is the burning of coal, isn't it true that Australia won't have a real long-term plan for drought until we have a plan to phase out coal and gas use? Senator Cormann. Um, no. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, do you agree with the coal mining lobby who at the New South Wales Bush Summit earlier this month presented themselves as the saviours of drought-stricken communities, despite the fact that their industry, the coal industry, is the major contributor to climate change? As you've accepted, that will make droughts more frequent and more severe. Isn't that industry making life harder for farmers right across Australia. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. I I'm, I'm somewhat um, intrigued by the line of questioning being pursued uh, by Senator Di Natale because one of his predecessors as leader of the Greens, uh, uh, Dr Bob Brown, of course, uh, you know, stood in the way. He didn't want us to have hydro energy in Tasmania. He wanted coal instead of hydro. And, you know, well, well, you could have knocked me over with a feather the other way when he had the opportunity to come out fighting for wind energy. And apparently now Dr. Bob Brown is also against wind energy. 
Uh, presumably, uh, that is because he still thinks uh, that uh, we uh, will uh, need order. Uh, to. Senator Cormann. Senator Di Natale on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, uh, Mr. President. Um, I deliberately kept uh, those questions very short. Very short preamble. Order. Very short preamble. Order. So, point of order on relevance. I asked specifically about whether the minister agreed with the coal mining lobby that they are the saviours of drought-stricken communities rather than the cause of climate-induced drought. Okay. Um, you have reminded the minister of the question. I take the opportunity to do the same. He has 23 minutes, seconds remaining to answer. Mr President, I do not agree with the framing of the question. Uh, our government uh, believes that the best way forward in terms of our energy supplies uh, is a technology-neutral technology approach. Coal will, of course, continue to be an important energy source for Australia for a, a, a very long time to come. And indeed, and indeed, coal uh, is uh, a very significant export for Australia, and uh, it will continue to be a significant part of our uh, economy uh, over uh, a very, Order. very long Senator time. Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to um, Minister for Finance, representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Reports in today's Australian newspaper have revealed that at least seven members of the government, including your colleagues, Senators Rennick, Stoker, and Patterson, are publicly lobbying to stop the legislated increases to the superannuation guarantee from 9.5 per cent to 12 per cent. Minister, can you rule out any changes to the timetable for the legislated increases to the superannuation guarantee as they are contained in the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act of 1992? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Yes. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier this year, uh, ASFA, the Association of Superannuation Funds, found that an average worker aged 30 earning $70,000 per year would be about $71,000 worse off in retirement if the rate of SG remains at 9.5 per cent, as opposed to moving to the legislated 12 per cent. Can the minister guarantee that Australian workers will get superannuation increases as they are currently legislated and that the Prime Minister won't cave into calls from his backbench to reduce working Order, people's Senator retirement Gallagher, time incomes? For the answer expired. Senator, Senator Thank, Senator thank Corbyn. you very much, uh, Mr President. I refer the uh, honourable senator to my previous answer. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and now to the minister. How can Australians trust this government with their super when successive governments have opposed superannuation and any increase to the superannuation guarantee rate, including stopping the planned superannuation guarantee increases back in 2014? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Of course, uh, in the lead-up to the 2013 election, we took uh, a policy position openly and transparently to the Australian people, and the Australian people uh, endorsed our plan and we acted consistent with the plan we took to the 2013 election. Uh, and in relation to the remainder, I refer the Honourable Senator to my previous answers. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Water Resources. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I know that farmers are doing it tough, yet in recent weeks, they have been watching but not accessing high water flows in the Murray rushing past their farms. Where is all that water going? It's on its way to South Australia to evaporate in a naturally marine estuary artificially made into a freshwater lake. Meanwhile, One Nation has long and vigorously advocated bringing waters into the Murray-Darling Basin from areas of consistent, reliable, high rainfall outside the basin to drought-proof the basin and ensure water security for Melbourne and Adelaide. Yet, Minister, how can water be allocated objectively, honestly and fairly when so few creek and river flows are measured? Without accurate data on water flows, how do we know the allocations are fair and honest? The Minister representing the Minister for Water Resources, Drought, Rural Finance, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Um, thank you, Mr President. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts, for your question. Uh, the government is also very, very concerned about our primary producers and wanting to ensure that they are able to fulfil their productive capacity, particularly at this time when uh, we are facing one of the worst droughts in our nation's history. And I know, uh, having travelled through the basin communities of New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria and South Australia, that it is very tough for those farmers who are facing unprecedented dry conditions 
to watch environmental flows uh, destined for other states and other places flow past their communities. But that is what the Murray-Darling Basin Plan actually uh, was set up to do, to ensure that water was uh, secured for environmental purposes and was able to be delivered to certain identified environmental assets along and throughout the basin communities, also to underpin the economic security of our farmers and their productive capacity going forward, and to ensure that those communities, those millions of Australians that live and raise families and run businesses in basin communities can actually look forward to a sustainable and prosperous future. Getting that balance right uh, between four different basin states has, as we all know in this chamber, uh, been a very, very difficult process. And it is not one that we here in the National Party and the Liberal Party have resiled away from. We fought very hard to make sure that that is a fair plan and that the mechanisms we use to deliver it are actually fair. We're the ones that actually fought to make sure a socio-economic detriment test was part of ongoing measurement of the success of the plan. And that means making sure our farmers and their communities are going to still be able to raise a family in a successful business in these communities uh, going forward when we're looking at taking out Order. Water. Senator McKenzie. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. So in my experience, Mr President, I've never seen a plan that works fairly or honestly without accurate data. Why are New South Wales farmers then, Senator McKenzie, paying $60,000 in water licences every year and not getting water allocation while precious water is released to become man-made floods and to evaporate in South Australia for no environmental benefit and much human and community suffering? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I also, as one of the few people in this place with a science degree, do like to base my policy decisions based on science and data. It is very difficult to make key decisions on uh, policy without that Order. accessing uh, stringent data. And that's why our government has initiated a range of measures to strengthen in compliance and enforcement including $35 million to expand metering and satellite remote sensing technology in the Northern Basin, $25 million to encourage the installation of metres by irrigators in the Northern Basin as part of a comprehensive package of measures uh, regarding the fish death reports, and $5 million for ca cameras to capture live stream river flows to provide transparency to the public. We're taking very seriously our role. It is also up to state governments, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, to also support their farmers to measure the flows accurately. Senator Roberts, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. So it looks like we will get measurements sometime which may give us some fairness in the future. But Senator Mc it's through you, Mr President. Senator McKenzie, if your rosy picture is so accurate, why are 500 desperate farmers suing the Murray-Darling Basin for seven authority for $750 million in compensation for alleged water mismanagement, which has left them with zero water allocation, while South Australian farmers are getting 97 to 100 per cent of their full allocation? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, Senator Roberts, as you know, you're a great fan of the Constitution. You often want to quote it to us all ad nauseum, but uh, you do know that the water uh, entitlements, the allocation of licences, the management of water to uh, particular irrigators is a responsibility constitutionally of the states. And so it is the New South Wales government who is responsible for issuing licences to New South Wales irrigators. Sorry, through you, Mr President. It is similarly uh, the, the purvey of the Victorian and the South Australian governments to do likewise. So I would suggest, uh, rather than come here with questions that are not related to the Commonwealth's work, to actually pursue those in state parliaments throughout the Murray-Darling Basin. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture. Can the Minister update the Senate on how is, how is the government getting on with the job of securing Australia's future by protecting farmers from the destructive behaviour of animal activists? Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Macdonald, for your question. I know you have a deep and abiding passion for the sustainability and profitability of farmers. 
This side of the parliament has always supported our farmers and our farming communities through good times and through bad, and that's why we're progressing tough new laws through the Criminal Code Amendment Agricultural Protection Bill to protect our farmers from those keyboard warriors who would incite teams of animal activists to trespass on farmland, steal, damage property and incite and intimidate uh, and harass. That's in the House of Representatives today. Farm trespass is an incredibly serious issue in regional Australia. Chaining yourself uh, to conveyor belts in abattoirs is similarly a serious issue in regional Australia. Farmers have contacted me, questioning their place in the industry, and it's too late for others because they've left altogether. But here we have an opposition, and indeed their, their partners in crime, the Greens, refusing to back Australian farmers, refusing to stand with the government and stand against animal activists who would seek to intimidate, harass, steal property, destruct. It's a pretty simple equation. And yet their weasel words, despite heading out into regional areas, despite going on their listening tours, it would seem that they haven't been listening. Because if they were out in regional communities, if they were talking to sale yard operators, abattoir operators, farmers and the like, they would know that farmers and at regional communities feel very, very strongly about the right for them, their families, their stock and their workers to feel safe at work. This week is National Farm Safety Week, so this is the time for the Labor Party to stand up, break the nexus between the Greens, who really just want to see us stop farming in this Order. country, and support Senator the McKenzie. bill. Senator McDonald, a supplementary question. What are the risks to farmers and the wider community from these trespassing activists? Senator McKenzie. Agricultural businesses should be operate their lawful businesses without be being subjected to farm invasion. When you trespass and steal, you are not a protester. You are not someone to be lauded as Richard Di Natale did in his comments around the bill. You know, somehow civil disobedience is okay if you don't agree with the law. You're not a protester. This is not a badge of honour. You're a criminal and you deserve to be punished with the full force of the law. Those who choose to damage property, to steal, need to be rightly and strongly held to account. These protections and the protections of their privacy are fundamental principles of our society. Activist actions are a risk to farm biosecurity. They risk the introduction of pests and disease to farm operations, reducing our access to markets, costing farmers in our regional communities millions of dollars and thousands of jobs. Active actions are also a risk to animal welfare, with some incredibly uh, disturbing animal outcomes Order. as a result Senator of farm McKenzie. invasions. Time for the answers expired. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Can you tell us how will the new government measures help to protect Australian farmers? Senator Mackenzie. Our government is getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people. We put protecting Australian farmers first, and that is why we're introducing this new broad-ranging legislation as a priority. Protecting Australian farmers is what we do. It's what we've always done. We understand uh, that our nation's wealth is built on the back of regional Australia, our farmers, our fishers and our foresters. We support farmers like the McNamee family, who farm near Milliman in Queensland, whose farm was invaded by around 100 activists. These trespassers refused to leave and harassed and disrupted the hardworking family and their employees. We must send a clear message to animal activists. If you use personal information to incite farm trespass, you will risk jail. You will risk jail up to five years. Now, heading out to Dubbo, the Bush summit, making claims that they're not going to play politics with regional Australia, they're not going to play politics with the fate of our farmers. This is your chance to do the right thing and stand up for them. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. The, the Earlhaven Aged Care facility on the Gold Coast in Queensland recently closed with more than 70 residents transported to other aged care facilities and a public hospital. And I want to acknowledge we all feel deeply concerned about the sudden closure of this facility and our thoughts are with those residents, families, carers and staff. My question is, when did the minister first become aware that there was a dispute at the Earlhaven aged care facility, that it was going to close 
and that the safety of, resi safety of residents was at risk. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colby. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Watt for the question. Uh, can I also, uh, along with him, express my uh, complete dismay at the events that occurred at Earl Haven uh, on uh, the 11th of July? Uh, what happened was a complete and utter disgrace. And how what seems to be a contractual dispute between two parties could descend to the extent that 71 aged and frail Australians were left without care uh, is, quite frankly, beyond me and I suspect Senator Watt and many others. So, Senator, I first found, I first heard that there was uh, concerns about what was happening at uh, Earl Haven on the afternoon of the 11th. Uh, it was first transmitted to me as the suggestion of a facility going into administration, and it wasn't until later in the evening when uh, more detailed reports came to me that the the uh, appearance of a contractual dispute came to light. Uh, later that evening, I had a full, uh, much fuller briefing from the department, uh, at which the circumstances of the events uh, were then transmitted to me. Uh, can I say, Mr. President, uh, at this point, I would also would like to express my appreciation to, firstly, the staff at Earl Haven who had the foresight to ring Triple O when these events started to unfold, uh, which led to the declaration of an emergency by Queensland Health. I also express my appreciation to Queensland Order. Health for their actions. Senator Colbeck. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. What is the impact on the availability of aged care places on the Gold Coast, given over 70 Earl Haven residents have been transferred to other Gold Coast facilities? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, and with Senator Watt's indulgence, I'll just complete a couple of points that I want to make uh, in relation to where I just finished off from a previous question. For, as, as I said, uh, I want to express ex sincere appreciation to the staff who stayed, despite uh, what I understand were instructions from their employer to leave the facility to look after the residents. That needs to be acknowledged. Uh, also to Queensland Health and Emergency Services for the work that they did in relocating the, the residents to other facilities around the region. Uh, it took a considerable period of time, it was a difficult operation uh, and it was important that it was conducted properly. Um, and also I'd like to express my appreciation for the other facilities in the region who took up that capacity. Uh, in respect of Senator Watt's specific question, there are, about, there are over 5,000 places in that particular region of Queensland, with an occupancy level of about 88 per cent, so there is Order. still some capacity Senator in Colby. the region. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt. Um, I thank the minister for his remarks about the efforts made by staff and other people to rectify this situation. And on that matter, what action has the minister taken to protect the Earl Haven workers who have not been paid outstanding wages and superannuation? Will the minister commit to ensuring these staff are paid what they are owed? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, like uh, Senator Watt, and I expect everyone else in this place, I am also concerned at reports that staff have not been paid their full entitlements, uh, including superannuation. Uh, as I understand it, uh, this is a as I understand it, this is a contractual dispute between two parties, and not about the financial viability of either party. And in that circumstance, uh, the staff should be paid their full entitlements. Uh, I would urge uh, the, the parties that uh, have not paid, and I understand uh, that is an organisation by the name of Help Street, to fully pay their staff, uh, to fully pay all of the entitlements that are due to their staff, uh, mm. because uh, the staff had no part in this. They are not party to the dispute. Uh, and they Senator should Colbeck. be paid. Senator Watt on a point of order? Just in the limited time the minister's got, I'm, what I'm asking for is whether the minister will commit to ensuring these staff are paid what they owe. Senator Watt, um, 
the minister is being directly relevant. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the company should pay their staff. Uh, there are forms through which that can occur, including— Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answers expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. How is the government getting on with the job of delivering for the Australian people by increasing trade opportunities, and how does this help to create a stronger economy that guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hughes for her question and congratulate her on her first question in the chamber uh, and welcome her to, uh, to this Senate chamber uh, after a slightly bumpy journey uh, in, uh, in getting here. And I know that Senator Hughes will be a very strong advocate. I know Senator Hughes was delighted to see the uh, Chief Justice on the uh, day of the swearing in, <laughs> but I, uh, I, uh, I should come back to the point. Mr. President, I know Senator Hughes will be, uh, as many of the new senators in this chamber will be, a strong and fierce advocate for the interests of Australia's exporters, particularly those in rural and regional communities around Australia. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Australia's free trade partners today account for more than 55 per cent of global, global GDP, or over 44 trillion dollars of economic activity. Uh, and this has grown immeasurably during our time in government. Uh, in fact, in terms of Australian exporters having duty-free or preferential access, they now enjoy that to around 2.8 billion consumers worldwide. And that's estimated to be an increase of nearly 1.8 billion consumers since the uh, Liberal National parties came to government. And what's the result of that increase, access, preferential access to more markets? Well, it's that exports have surged by more than 30 per cent during the last five years. Trade is estimated to have contributed, contributed around one quarter of Australia's economic growth over the past five years. We've, as a nation, recorded trade surpluses in 27 out of the last 29 months. And indeed, Australia enjoyed a trade surplus of $34 billion during the last 12 months having turned around what we inherited as a trade deficit of $20 billion in 2012-13. This is a very strong track record. But what does it mean, Mr President? Well, it means, of course, that with those growth in exports, Australian businesses are doing better, employing more, paying more tax, creating more opportunities that stimulating the economy Order. and opportunities for Senator all Australians. Birmingham. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister inform the Senate about the key highlights of Australia's trade performance and what that means for our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I pay tribute to our exporters around the country, our exporters in, uh, in the goods sector, in the farming sector, in the services sector, who are recording record after record at present. In 2018, we achieved record exports of 438 billion dollars as a nation. And we achieved a record trade surplus in May this year of $5.7 billion, and indeed the five largest monthly trade surpluses ever recorded on record have all been delivered in calendar year 2019. This is a tribute to those businesses, a tribute uh, to our exporters, to the Australian businesses who get up and go out and seek and seize opportunities around the world. And the benefits that flow through to that, Australian businesses that export on average hire 23 per cent more staff than those who do not. They pay their employees an estimated 11.5 per cent more than those who don't export, and they have labour productivity rates around 13 per cent higher than those who don't export. So opening up to the world delivers real benefits, tangible benefits to their employees Order. and, as a result, to Senator households Birmingham. around Australia. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how does ratifying our trade agreements lead to more jobs and a stronger economy without raising taxes? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, the type of preferential access that our trade agreements have opened up uh, have enabled the type of records that I talked about before and, in doing so, seeing benefits flow through. Nearly 52,000 Australian businesses in 2016-17 were exporting, and that was up more than 16 per cent from just a few years earlier. More than 16 per cent growth in the number of businesses exporting, and that's estimated to have contributed around 240,000 additional trade-related jobs. All of that is partly accountable to the increased market access those businesses have. 
The Liberal National Parties know what we stand for when it comes to providing more market access and more opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses to, ex to export. That's why we will continue to pursue the expansion of our free trade agreement networks, while we want to make sure that we ratify and bring into force agreements with Peru, Hong Kong and Indonesia, and why we are determined to pursue opportunities with the European Union and our regional partners through the RCEP process as well. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Minister, I refer you to comments of Papua New Guinea Prime Minister Marape, who said he would like to see offshore detention ended there, and I quote from him, as soon as possible, and that he has requested your government provide a timetable. Order. Order. I'd like to hear the question. Order on both sides of the chamber, left and right. Order. Senator McKim, please continue. Thank you. And, I, uh, uh, and that uh, Prime Minister Marape has requested your government provide a timetable for ending offshore detention on Manus Island. What commitments has your government given to PNG government about the future of offshore detention? And have you agreed to provide a timetable as requested by Mr Marape? Minister, after six long years, when will your political prisoners on Manus Island and Nauru finally be given the freedom and safety they need and deserve? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator McKim, for that uh, question. Uh, as I said to Senator Keneally, uh, you also keep uh, perpetuating a complete falsehood. There is nobody detained on Manus Island. There is no detention centre there. Um, and it's <laughs> I'll also note, uh, Senator McKim, that uh, you were not detained in Papua New Guinea either in your most recent visit. Uh, so, Senator McKim, I think so. The very Order. short answer is that there is nobody in detention in Manus Island. As I said again to Senator Keneally, we had a very productive meeting today. Senator Cormann was there. Senator Payne was there. We had very cordial discussions with the Papua New Guinea Prime Minister and ministers on the way forward, including. Uh, in Manus Island. And it, again, I've got nothing further to add because what she order. said is Senator a complete McKim, falsehood. Senator on a point of order. Uh, thank you. The minister has just said she has nothing further to add, but a specific question I asked her was whether or not the Australian government has provided a timetable as requested by Mr Marape, and I ask you to Senator, uh, direct the minister Senator to the McKim, question. You know full well I cannot direct the minister to answer part of a question. You yourself said it was a question amongst the question you asked. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And just to be very clear, I completely reject the whole premise of your question because there are nobody there is nobody in detention on Manus Island. And in fact, you mentioned these six years. Uh, and who started those six years? Who was it who actually put people in detention there in the first place? That was those opposite, Labor and the Greens. We have worked tirelessly for six years because, remember, under all of you opposite, 50,000 people came by boat, 1,200 people that we know of died a horrific death. So that was not us. We have worked tirelessly internationally and in cooperation with the PNG government to fix the shameful mess that you left. We are very Order. proud of our record and what we have done in that. And uh, Minister Cormann reminds me that, in fact, the Prime Minister today, when talking about Manus, was noting at how peaceful and how uh, peaceful and beautiful Manus Island is, and in fact would welcome uh, tourists and others Order. to come and visit Senator Manus Reynolds, uh, time and to for the see answer for themselves. Has expired. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, President. Minister, both you here today and the Prime Minister have claimed that the people exiled to Manus Island six years ago are not in detention. If there are no detention centres, as you and the Prime Minister claim, what was that place with guards on the gate, with razor wire on the fences that people are locked up in each and every night that I was denied entry to last week and ultimately deported from Papua New Guinea for asking permission to enter? What exactly was that place? Order. Senator Reynolds. Order, Senator McKim. Senator, order, Senator McKim. Senator Reynolds. S Senator McKim, no, no matter how much you scream in this place, 
no matter how disgracefully you act as a senator of this place in another country, as a guest of another country, cannot change the fact that there are no people in detention there on Manus Island. You have clearly learnt nothing over the last six years uh, about the, the consequences Order. of your policies. We have spent six years working with the Papua New Guinean government, and again that was reinforced to the, today in what we are doing to clean up your mess. Again, I will say there is nobody in detention on Manus Island, and no matter how badly you behave in someone else's country as a guest of their country, that does not change the facts as they sit. And I've gone through several times today in this chamber. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, and I categorically reject that I behaved in any way uh, badly while I was on Papua New Guinea. I simply politely asked to enter that prison. Uh, I note the comments of New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern, who has again reiterated her generous and kind offer to accept 150 people per year from Manus Island and Nauru. Minister, how can your government continue to reject that offer and deny desperate people the freedom and safety that they need and deserve? Order. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Senator McKim. And again, I would say I completely reject the whole premise of your question. Nobody is in detention in Papua New Guinea. The government of Papua New Guinea determines who can enter the East Longo Refu Refugee Transit Centre and respective entry requirements. And if they denied you entry, that is order. a matter for the Papua Senator New Guinean government. Reynolds, Senator, and they put out Senator a Reynolds, release on a point of order, I've got Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Um, uh, thank you. Perhaps the minister didn't hear my final supplementary, uh, but what it specifically asked was about the offer from New Zealand and uh, this government's rejection of that and offer, Senator, and she is yet to approach Senator that Senator McKim, the, you did have a preamble to that question. I consider that to be part of the question, and the minister is entitled to address that and be directly relevant. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And again, this is a matter for the government of Papua New Guinea. You went, Senator McKim, to a, a friend, a friendly nation, a country of which we, are very, we have great deep connections with, and they denied you entry to a facility that is in their control. So it is an issue for them. But I've got to say, uh, reading a little bit about your conduct, I'm a little ashamed that somebody in this chamber went again to a friend's country, a neighbour's country, and acted in the way that you did, Senator McKim. That is, uh, that is something for your conscience, but again, it's not something that this government or anybody else Order. I would hope in this chamber Time would Time for the answers expired. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. People Care Party Limited is the company contracted to operate the Earl Haven Aged Care Facility. Can the minister confirm that People Care Party Limited has been sanctioned on at least five separate occasions? Can the minister advise the Senate when People Care Party Limited has been sanctioned on any further occasions? I'll, I'll preface this by saying I, there might have been a slight mix-up with the question order. I'll proceed with this, but we appear to have different documents. If an error has been made, I apologise in advance. I'll call Senator Colbeck. I'll call Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't have a f th uh, and thanks, Senator, for the question. I don't have a full list of the sanctions over time against people care with me, but I'm happy to provide that information to the Senate on notice. Uh, but I can confirm that on Saturday, the 13th of this month, sanctions were further sanctions were uh, applied against people care as a result of the events of the 11th of July. Uh, those sanctions, uh, there, are, there, are, there are four elements to those particular sanctions, Mr President, uh, and uh, uh, there is also further work that's being done uh, by my department with respect to the um, approved provider status of the facility off the back of those events. Uh, and, uh, once the work has been completed with respect to uh, that work, uh, there may be further, um, further requirements for People Care Proprietary Limited uh, with respect to its ongoing operations, but that work is not yet complete. Senator Chisholm, supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. 
Were there any complaints about the Earlhaven aged care in the past 12 months prior to the closure of the facility? If so, what action will the minister take? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thank you for the question. Uh, if you're talking about what action I will take versus what action was taken in respect of the complaints, uh, they're two very separate matters, Mr. President. Uh, uh, so, Senator, uh, I'll have to take the specific specifics of complaints in relation to the facility on notice. Um, well, I, 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 I do have a brief. Um, so, uh, so, Senator, and uh, with respect to what's happening with the facility uh, right now, as I've said, with, with respect to what's happening with the facility right now, Mr. President, uh, there are clearly sanctions in place against the facility uh, that that have an impact of seeing the facility not being Order. able to. Senator Colbeck, time for the answer expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Wowzers, we'll see how we go, hey. When did the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission last visit the Earlhaven Aged Care Facility prior to it closing? Senator Colbeck. Hello. I'm just looking through my brief to see if that's there. So, Senator, I, I'm not certain of the actual date when they last visited the facility, Mr. President, uh, and I'm happy to provide uh, that information to the chamber on notice, as I've said. So order. the Senator Colbeck, Senator, what on a point of order? Mr. President, the, the minister hasn't been able to answer the most basic questions about a catastrophic Senator, Senator Watt, that, closure what of an aged care order? facility. What is your point of order? He, relevance. He, well, I'm he has not been able to answer that, any. Senator question. Watt, please. Is, I, I, I give some, Senator Cormann. Uh, there, there clearly is no point of order. The minister is absolutely within his rights to take a question on notice, which is what he's done. But there's absolutely, well, you know, this is a debating point, uh, as uh, you should know. That there's absolutely no point of order. Senator Watt, I, I grant some liberality in people restating their question. That is a matter entirely for debate. There's an opportunity for that directly after question time. The minister is entitled, as the leader said, to take anything on notice. He is being directly relevant. I call on him to continue if he wishes. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take the specific details of uh, all visits uh, by the uh, Aged Care and Quality Commissioner to the facility on notice and provide you with a detailed list, uh, because that is, uh, I think, a reasonable question for the Chamber to ask in respect of what's happened last weekend. Uh, and as I've quite clearly said, there are sanctions in place that severely impact on the capacity of the facility to operate, uh, and until those uh, conditions and the conditions of those sanctions are met, the facility Order. won't be able to operate. Time has expired, further. Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Motions to take note of answers. Senator Farrell. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, Chair. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Rustin to the question that uh, I asked. Um, Madam uh, De Deputy uh, President, um, um, I am uh, a little bit surprised at the uh, answers that uh, we got from uh, Senator uh, Rustin in respect to the questions that I uh, asked regarding her <coughs> statement that uh, the pension is too, uh, too generous. Um, this was an opportunity, uh, Deputy President, for <coughs> the minister to uh, come clean and uh, say that she made a mistake about uh, the generosity of the pension uh, and to, uh, to apologise to uh, those pensioners, uh, particularly in her home state of South Australia, uh, as you would know um, <coughs> Uh, Deputy President, uh, South Australia uh, per capita has the highest number of pensioners uh, in, the, uh, in the country. Um, <coughs> Senator Rustin's uh, comments were quite offensive to those uh, pensioners, many of them who are, um, who are uh, struggling and, uh, and doing it hard. The opportunity that uh, Senator <coughs> Rustin had uh, was to 
uh, say to those pensioners in South Australia and the rest of the country, look, I made a mistake. <coughs> um, the pension is not too uh, generous, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to apologise uh, for uh, for saying that to uh, to those pensioners. Instead, the best we got, uh, Deputy President, was that she wanted to clarify her comments. Well, I don't think the <coughs> I don't think the comments needed clarification. We knew exactly what the minister was saying. She was saying to all those pensioners out there, "Your pension is too generous." Uh, what what pensioners and what the community wanted to, uh, uh, to hear the minister say was, yes, I was mistaken. The pension is not too generous, uh, and I apologise uh, for those comments. <coughs> then in the second question that I asked uh, the minister, I said, look, have you spoken to the treasurer or any other uh, member of the government uh, about these comments? <coughs> and again, uh, the minister had an opportunity to tell the Australian people uh, about the conversations that she's had with the treasurer and uh, other uh, uh, members of the uh, of the government uh, in regards to her comments about the generosity of the pension. Um, but we didn't get an answer, Deputy President. I know this will surprise you uh, that we didn't get an answer, but we didn't get an answer. There was an opportunity for Senator Rustin to say, "Yes, <clears throat> I've spoken with the treasurer." Uh, he's acknowledged that the, uh, the uh, pension is not too generous, uh, and uh, I agree with him in respect of that. But again, we missed that opportunity for, uh, from Senator uh, Rustin. So we still don't know <coughs> who's right in the government. Is it Senator Rustin, the minister responsible for pensioners <coughs> in this government, uh, saying one thing, or is it uh, uh, Minister uh, Frydenberg? Um, saying another thing. So, what is the position of the government? I'm sure you'd like to know that uh, answer, uh, Deputy uh, President. Now, my third question uh, related to um, <coughs> a statement by uh, Mr. Ian uh, Henschke. Ian uh, Henschke is quite a famous South Australian. He was a, a uh, famous, um, famous um, a broadcaster, great broadcaster. An even better winemaker. <coughs> yes, he was a winemaker. Uh, but on this occasion, he was talking in his capacity as an advocate for seniors, and uh, he got the ball rolling on the deeming rate. And he nailed the government. He nailed the government on this issue, because the government has been secretly squirrelling away uh, money that uh, ought to have been in the pockets of pensioners. How was the government doing that? Well. Uh, <coughs> While the RBA was reducing interest rates, uh, the government kept the so-called deeming rate uh, way, way above uh, the level that the RBA has set. Now, you might say, um, Madam Deputy President, that interest rates dropping is a good thing. But the reality is, if you're trying to rely on those interest rates to supplement what is not a generous pension, then of course you're, uh, you're struggling. Uh, more importantly, I think <coughs> it's worth noting that uh, dropping interest rates is not the sign of a good economy, it's a sign of an economy in trouble. And of course, that's what we know is happening in this, uh, in this country at the moment. But thanks to uh, Mr. Ian Henschke, he got the ball rolling on this and he nailed the government. They were squirrelling away money that should have been in the pockets of pensioners and keeping Thank it for you, themselves. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, you have to give them points for chutzpah. You have got to give the Labor Party points for chutzpah uh, because it's, there's only one political party in this chamber, maybe two if you include the Greens, who have an actual plan to cost retirees and pensioners money. There's only one political party or political movement proposing to take money away from retirees and to make their retirement less financially secure, and that is the Labor Party. Uh, by contrast, the Liberal and National parties, through a successful election victory, have saved 900,000 older Australians from a severe financial hit to be perpetrated by those opposite if they were successful at this election. Uh, you took a policy to the election proposing to take away from 900,000 Australians the franking credits that they had planned their retirement for and upon. 
They were reliant on those franking credits for their security retirement. They made their plans when the rules were set, and you planned to, take, to pull the rug out from underneath them. You did not even have the decency to protect those who are currently in retirement and well advanced in their years, who had no capacity to change their financial affairs to accommodate these changes by grandfathering it. You did not even have the decency to do that. You wanted to smash and grab their bank accounts, raid their bank accounts for your own spending plans. Uh, we won't be taking any lectures from a political party uh, that was proposing uh, that 84 per cent of the people to be affected should earn $37,000 a year or less and could lose up to a third of their retirement income. By contrast, what the Liberal and National Parties are doing, and under Prime Minister Morrison, is they're actually improving the retirement security and financial security of older Australians. Uh, we have announced uh, in just the last fortnight that uh, older Australians who, have, who are on a part pension, who have uh, investments, uh, will be now eligible to receive a will now be assessed as having received a lower rate, a lower deeming rate, and that means real money into the real pockets of real Australians on the pension. They will be better off financially as a result of a decision this government has make, made, not as a result of any uh, rhetoric you've brought into this chamber. That's a million Australians uh, who can be, if they're a single, up to $800 a year better off, uh, and as for couples, up to $1,000 a year better off. I want to uh, address one other question uh, from question time today, and that was by Senator Gallagher on the question of superannuation. She mentioned me in her question. Uh, of course, it's entirely appropriate uh, that the government has commissioned a retirement incomes review as a, as a recommendation of the Productivity Commission. The Productivity Commission rightly recognised that it is no good putting more money into superannuation if that superannuation system is broken, as we believe it currently is. My good friend and colleague Senator Hume will be presenting legislation to this chamber soon to help fix some of those problems. And I hope in this parliament, in contrast to the last one, that the Labor Party and the crossbench are more willing to work with the government to fix those problems. They're more willing to work with us to make sure that fees don't eat up the low balances of many Australians' uh, superannuation. I hope they're willing to work with us to make sure that inappropriate insurance isn't given to, to people in their superannuation accounts, uh, which also eats up their uh, mega balances. The government is rightly acting on the advice uh, of the Productivity Commission uh, on that. Uh, I also think that it is worthwhile for the government and for the Retirement Incomes Review to examine the wisdom of increasing the compulsory superannuation contribution from 9.5 per cent to 12 per cent. Uh, we know that when those opposite were previously in, in government that the Treasury Department under the Secretary Ken Henry advised against increasing uh, the superannuation guarantee because they advised that it would, it would hurt the take-home pay of working Australians. Uh, that research has been replicated again in recent weeks by the Grattan Institute. I have to confess I am not always a fan of the work of the Grattan Institute. It was indeed founded by Kevin Rudd and John Brumby with $30 million of taxpayers' money, but nonetheless in this instance I think they have done some very compelling work. And unlike the group that Senator Gallagher quoted in Question Time, uh, they are not a vested interest that stands to gain from increasing superannuation contributions. But the truth is, in this game, uh, whether it is industry super, retail super, any super, uh, them and their associations are not good sources of independent advice because they seek, they seek to uh, reap the rewards of billions of dollars of more money of Australians' retirement uh, savings. Uh, the truth is we need to very carefully consider whether it is a good idea for Australians to potentially receive lower take-home pay even, and, and maybe not even receive a higher retirement benefit as a result. So the government will be taking no lectures at all from the Labor Party on the question of protecting the interests of older Australians. Thank you, Senator yeah. Patterson. Well, Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that was a very interesting uh, contribution because someone listening uh, to that uh, contribution wouldn't really, I think, understand what we are actually debating here today, what we are taking note on here today. We are taking note on the question from Senator Farrell to, to Minister Rustin around her comments on the, a radio interview with 3AW's Neil Mitchell, where she described the age pension as generous. Not once in Senator Patterson's contribution did we hear him trying to um, support her, defend her in any way, because everyone in this chamber knows it is indefensible. Her comments were completely out of touch with what is going on in Australia and what is happening 
in terms of people on the age pension. Senator Rustin, in her response to Senator Farrell, um, really all she could say, all she she refused to apologise. Let's just let's get that on the record. She refused to apologise, and you know you have to ask yourself why is it so hard to apologise for some for comments that were so obviously, so obviously <laughs> wrong, so obviously offensive to hundreds of thousands of aged pensioners in Australia. Why is it so hard to apologise? But it, anyway, she, um, Senator Rustin refused to apologise. She did accept that um, pensioners were doing it um, tough. Now, obviously, I think after that, after you get the Treasurer, uh, Mr Frydenberg, refusing to endorse, just like Senator Patterson did in his contribution, ref refusing to endorse uh, Senator Rustin's characterisation of the pension, because you know we all know we are talking about $66 a day. That's what we're talking about. That's what that's the amount of money that pensioners receive, age pensioners receive, that Senator Rustin calls generous, but. We have the treasurer refusing to endorse. In fact, he said, and, and it's worth repeating, as Senator, it was in a part of uh, Senator Farrell's question to Senator Rustin, that and the treasurer said, "I understand pensioners have challenging times, and a number of pensioners are doing it really, really tough." Now that was in response. That was in response to. Um, being asked about whether he supports uh, Senator uh, Rustin's comments around the pension. Of course, he, using one of um, Senator um, Cormann's uh, phrases, he we were wobbled around that, and and he refuses to support. It. And you can't blame him. You can't blame him from for refusing to endorse those comments because they were wrong and they're out of touch there are you know we're talking about $66 a day and we also have enough uh, reports and evidence and research some of which have actually been um, funded by the minister's own department around poverty and and people living in in, on the age pension in poverty. Some of that research has been actually funded by the minister's own department. Maybe the problem is, is this is a government that's had six or seven ministers in this area since they ca came to government in, uh, in the last six years. What does that say? What does that say to Australians? That says that this government does not have the an interest in this community services area. They, ha they have had six ministers, including, including the Prime Minister. They should be ashamed. The Thank minister you, should Senator be ashamed. Brown, your time has expired. Senator Seselja. Thank you, um, Deputy President, uh, and very pleased to uh, respond to. Uh, Senator Farrell's motion uh, in relation to the question asked to Minister Rustin. And just to deal firstly uh, with uh, some of Senator Brown's contribution where she talked about uh, what Senator Rustin had had to say. Senator Rustin made it very clear uh, and has made it very clear uh, that uh, what she was referring to, of course, uh, was the fact uh, that as a nation uh, we do make, rightly make, a decision. Uh, that we will prioritise uh, with the largest part of our budget uh, to the welfare of our nation. Uh, many Australians benefit from uh, those welfare payments, and no one uh, suggests anything other uh, than those who are on a pension or many other payments uh, are doing it tough. 
uh, and that is why uh, we've seen the, the twice yearly increases. Uh, and of course, we look to uh, lower cost of living pressures for Australians across the board, uh, whether they are pensioners, uh, whether they are low and middle income earners. Uh, we are always on the side of those who are doing it tough, uh, those who have worked very hard over their working lives and are now seeking to enjoy their retirements, uh, be they pensioners, be they self-funded retirees. Uh, that is fundamentally what the Liberal National Party uh, has stood for uh, for generations. Uh, but alternatively, uh, we have just had a federal election where the Labor Party sought to punish a portion of the Australian community, uh, namely retirees, namely retirees, and sought to punish them to pay for their promises. Now, these are people who the Labor Party and the former Labor leader, uh, Mr Shorten, referred to as the top end of town. He talked about them receiving gifts from the taxpayers uh, when they got their franking credits, and who now, uh, now the new Labor leader, Mr Albanese, acknowledges when they were talking about them as being the top end of town uh, that they were wrong, that actually that was just rhetoric designed to pit one part of the community against another part, to talk about the top end of town, to talk about the other. Uh, you know, he said uh, Mr Albanese talked about uh, the Caboolture retiree who earned $1,200 a year from franking credits. And he said they felt that though we weren't giving them respect—no, they weren't—and that we were classifying them as wealthy, but they weren't wealthy. Well, doesn't that go to the heart of what we saw at this election when it came to retired Australians and when it came to older Australians. It was absolute disdain from the Labor Party, something that won't be forgotten for a long time. And let me deal with a couple of aspects of how disdainful they were of older Australians. Uh, the shadow treasurer at the time, Mr Bowen, he effectively said to older Australians who were concerned about losing, in some cases, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000 a year of their limited income. Well, you can just go vote for someone else, because he was so confident uh, that they would have enough votes, completely ignoring self-funded retirees and pensioners, uh, that they would be able to skate into office and pit one group of Australians against another. The other part that was particularly disdainful towards older Australians was the fact that they chose not even to grandfather this policy. So as bad as, their, as bad as Labor's housing tax and negative gearing policies were, at the very least in bringing in that destructive or proposing to bring in those destructive tax changes, they acknowledged uh, that they wouldn't hit members of the Labor Party, for instance, many, many members of the shadow front bench who own existing properties. They wouldn't be hitting them uh, with changed tax arrangements. But when it came to the, the self-funded retiree in Caboolture, relying on $1,200 a year in franking credits, well, they said, bad luck. We're going to take that from you on day one. You may have structured your affairs in order to look after yourself. You may be on a modest income, uh, but the Labor Party said, we're going to take that money away from you. So we're not going to be lectured to them on that. It wasn't just bad policy. It wasn't just the politics of envy. It wasn't just referring to retired Australians, to self-funded retirees as the top end of town. It was proposing to take away uh, money that they were entitled to, that they'd structured their affairs about. Uh, this is how the Labor Party treats older Australians. Uh, they sought to pit older Australians against younger Australians. Uh, they sought to pit uh, those on middle incomes against those on somewhat higher incomes. Uh, well, the Australian people saw through it, and particularly retired Australians saw through it. They, they took Chris Bowen's advice and they did exactly what he said and they voted Thank against you, the Labor Party Sassel, as a result of those destructive expired. policies. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, this government is out of touch, as shown by Senator Rushton's comment on pensions. It is absolutely symptomatic of what is a poor culture in our government in terms of looking after older Australians. Now, what is the government's position on the age pension in Australia at the moment? Senator Rushton seems to think it's generous, whilst Mr Frydenberg, the nation's treasurer, says he understands that pensioners have challenging times and, indeed, that pensioners do it really, really tough. Now, Senator Rushton did a disservice to this place this afternoon when she would not say 
if she had been counselled for her remarks. Now, I can only take that to mean that she was, although, frankly, the whole country was counselling her on the inappropriateness of those remarks, as the callers in the many pensioners that called in to 3AW after she made those remarks illustrators, illustrated. The government uh, needs to make it clear, are pensioners doing it tough or is the pension generous? Is it little wonder that we on this side of the chamber are worried or that the nation's pensioners are worried about what might be in the next government's budget? Will they be there to want to remove the energy supplement? Older Australians deserve much better than this out-of-touch government. So let's have a look at exactly what Minister Rustin said. She said, um, she said, I don't think a debate about whether I could live on the pension or not is relevant. It is a generous amount of money that the Australian taxpayers make available to our older Australians. It doesn't seem very ambiguous to me. She said very clearly that the pension is generous. Neil, uh, the, the interviewer, Neil Mitchell, said the pension is generous. Ms. Rustin did not, uh, Senator Rustin did not um, respond to that at the time. She was already moving on. She said the other thing we also need to realise is, and Neil says, I'm sorry, you said the pension is generous. Here, Senator Rustin finally seemed to wise up. Uh, as to the political problem she'd made for herself. She said, in terms of the amount of money that taxpayers fund our social welfare system, we put a lot of money into it. Putting a lot of money into something, uh, Madam Depu Deputy President, does not equal generosity. Even if it is one of the highest and largest amounts of expenditure on the books for our nation, that doesn't equate to generosity. There is absolutely no correlation to the size of the amount of money that's put aside in our nation's budget and the need. As the per capita report uh, shows, uh, that we asked about, $66 a day is not generous. This per capita report makes clear that the age pension is barely effective in keeping our most financially vulnerable and older citizens out of poverty. They say, as one of the wealthiest nations in the world, we should be looking beyond simple survival for our elder citizens. What would I take that as code to mean? If we're going to look beyond simple survival, well, that would have some quotient of generosity in it, I would think. But this report shows that the age pension dependency in Australia means a life of poverty and deprivation for thousands of our fellow Australians. They highlight that Australia can and should do better than this. It is little wonder that pensioners around Australia reacted so angrily to this, and I think Senator Rushton uh, should be held, continue to be held to account. Thank you, Senator Pratt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell to take note of answers given by uh, Minister Rushton be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, well, on Thursday uh, last week, the Bureau of Meteorology said Senator I, I, rise to, I rise to take note of an answer given by the minister. Um, um, which minister? Uh, minister Cormann. Thank you. Uh, on Thursday last week, the Bureau of Meteorology said that the drought that the Murray Darling Basin was experiencing was, I quote, the most severe in 120 years of records. No question. People right across the country, in the Murray-Darling Basin in particular, are struggling. 
and it's about time we started to address the issue of drought. It's a good thing that it's on the parliamentary agenda over this fortnight. But let's be clear what's happening. The government has decided to set up a drought relief fund, which is effectively a slush fund for its National Party backers. Uh, we know what happens when you put the Nationals in charge of water. We've seen the uh, rampant uh, corruption and mismanagement of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Uh, and so they establish a fund uh, that ostensibly is to look after their mates, and then they dare the ALP to support it. it uses a wedge against the ALP. Well, people deserve better than that. They deserve better than a government deciding to play politics uh, with an issue that is affecting the lives of people right across the country. The single biggest contributor uh, to uh, this drought and indeed uh, future droughts, or at least a major uh, contributor, uh, is the impact of climate change on drought. You can't be serious about drought unless you take strong action on climate change. We know that current and future droughts will be more severe and more frequent unless we're prepared to take strong action on climate change. Now we know that the single biggest cause of climate change is coal. So unless we've got a plan to transition out of coal into renewables, we actually don't have a plan to deal with climate change. And therefore you can't be serious about tackling drought. Right now Australia's pollution levels have never been higher. They've never been higher than they are right now. We are pumping so much heat trapping gas into our oceans and our atmosphere that we are on track on track to shoot up to 3 to 4 degrees of warming which will have catastrophic impacts on both the climate but also on those agricultural communities that are struggling we know that uh, climate change has already contributed to a southward shift in weather systems and that of course is a big contributor to what's going on here we know that rainfalls decreased by 15 per cent in South East Australia and Western Australia's South West region, another 15 per cent decline in cool season rainfall. Climate change is increasing the intensity and frequency of hot days and heat waves in Australia, exacerbating drought conditions. So we've got to get serious about tackling climate change. Rather than come up with silly political wedges designed to uh, show uh, that uh, you're more interested in the politics uh, the, than the outcome. How about we get serious about the causes of drought? And we said, as I said earlier, one of the major contributors to drought is the breakdown of our climate. And of course, it's not just coal, it's gas. Our gas exports are driving some of the biggest growth in emissions. You've got methane that's leaking out of fracking wells. You've got huge amounts of energy needed to convert it to LNG. And of course, our accounts don't even include the pollution that occurs from, mine, uh, from the uh, burning uh, of that gas in other jurisdictions. We're now the biggest exporter of coal and gas. We have to get serious about tackling climate change if we're going to be serious about tackling drought. Indeed, what we had at a summit uh, only uh, a few days ago was the mining industry putting themselves forward as the saviour for drought-stricken agricultural communities. This stuff writes itself. The coal industry, responsible for the mining, burning and exporting of coal, the biggest contributor to climate change, one of the significant drivers of drought in this country that it's affecting regional communities and the coal industry saying, well, we're here to help. Well, with friends like that, who needs enemies? It's about time we got serious about tackling climate change. That means a transition away from coal, oil and gas to renewable technologies, ushering in the tens of thousands of jobs that come with making that transition and ensuring that agriculture in this country is viable for generations to come. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Di Natale to take note of answers from Minister Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.